Hello, and thank you so much for joining me in the session. Thank you to Bo Arts and Leah for inviting me. Um, and thank you to everyone involved in these wonderful series of events. The talk I'm going to be giving today is going to be uh, just a bit of a provocation. Fault Lines, The Poetics of Borders and Environmental Crises. I will also include a little bit of poetry interspersed here and there related to this topic. My name is Kairani Baroka. You can call me Oka. I don't have a surname. Um, I'm an Indonesian woman with black rimmed glasses, lipstick, dangly silver earrings, and I'm wearing a green top against a beige wall. So when we speak about climate crisis, we are speaking about the very end of a long tale of environmental destruction that is wrought by colonial capitalist forces and that has been wrought over the past 500 years. And the way that climate crisis is portrayed currently in Western media seems to be um, still using the language of it's coming, it's imminent, it's happening to us all over the world suddenly because we humans have done this, right? And this ignores the fact that for most of the world and the global majority, climate crisis is here. It's happening. And I think that Western countries are feeling that more and more as well. But uh, for people in uh, the global majority, there have already been dire consequences um, and deaths and injuries and disabilities created by climate crisis. Um, there have been as you probably all know, an increase in natural disasters around the world. But what really uh, fascinates and horrifies me is the complete erasure, usually, of the fact that this is a result of colonial capitalism. This did not just start because, as I heard one writer say once, this was all done to make people's lives better. Um, as I think many of you understand and know deeply, our lifestyles today are created from the extraction of natural resources, a term that I do not like to use um, because it diminishes other cosmovisions, so to speak, other indigenous ways of knowing and being with the world and not seeing things as resources to be taken, but things to be in harmony with and to live alongside with. I think that a lot of the time uh, we are deliberately made to feel numb or indifferent towards the people who make our clothes, who source our food, who um, whose homes have been destroyed by the mines that create the laptops and phones that we use every day, um, from the palm oil plantations that devastate and kill many hundred thousands of peoples. Um, in Indonesia alone, in 2015, I think nearly 100,000 people were killed by forest fires, and I recently met a German journalist who said, oh, I reported on that, but I only reported on the orangutans. Um, my book is called Ultimatum Orangutan from Nine Arches Press. Orangutan is an Indonesian word. Every time you say orangutan, you're speaking Indonesian without knowing it. Orang means person or peoples. Utan means forest or forests, because um, the singular can be plural in Indonesian. So we perceive the, the animals as people of the forest, and yet when you speak about palm oil plantations or devastation of the natural environment, human deaths and human genocides are so often left out in the Western media. Um, and all of this framing of climate crisis, environmental crisis is something new, and this is humans that did this instead of, you know, this has been a centuries long fight by humans to protect lands against the encroachment of colonial capitalism is, I think, really troubling. So there's a long intertwined history of environmental crises and political borders. Borders are made by humans. They are artificial. There's no, you know, <laughs> most of the time there's no, there's no line stating, uh, you know, this is this state and this is the other state or this is this province and this is the other province right there might be a sign but as we all know borders are artificial and man-made um when colonists came to uh what is now known as north america by colonists in 1492 
um, and and start sorry to the Americas in 1492. Uh, this was an imposition of borders, right? Colonialism is the imposition of borders, and borders dictate who is allowed to take from what is within those borders. So, the very fact that there are forests that suddenly became in Indonesia, where I'm from, Dutch property to be ravaged and uh, used to make things to ship to the Netherlands, that is all because somebody came in with a gun and said, or knives at, and or other weapons and said, you know, these are our forests, these are our borders, you don't live here anymore, you don't live in harmony with these forests anymore, um, and all of this is going to be extracted to go to Europe. Um, uh, interestingly, I recently found out that my great-grandfather uh, was a forest ranger who quit, and there's something of a feeling that myself and an another close family member have that he wanted to side with, you know, the indigenous peoples that he, he came from in rejecting that these forests belong to the Dutch, right? Um, that they need to be patrolled <laughs> so that people don't steal from these border-created Dutch forest, right? Um, and when you think about the artificial separation of man or humankind, body and mind, this is something that um, Zoe Todd and Heather Davis have written about in their academic article about the Anthropocene, about how, you know, the concept of the Anthropocene is actually, you know, it the changing of the natural world to a, a destructive genocidal degree hap began very violently 500 years ago, right? And that's when you should count the Anthropocene. I think in Western media, Anthropocene only over the past 100 years since the Industrial Revolution. And it's like, no, you know, people understood the cost of genocidal greed ravaging natural wildlands and the stewards of them. And because of the separation between man and nature that Western colonists imposed, so too the creation of borders for national parks and national forests. In order to have a national forest, you must have a nation, right? And the nation has political borders. However, around the world in the global majority, these national parks are often created by kicking off indigenous peoples from their lands, um, including very violent assaults by organizations such as the World Wildlife Fund, and you can Google this. This is There's articles in The Guardian, etc. about this, um, by large international environmental organizations that are pro-conservation but do not respect indigenous peoples as the steward of, stewards of lands. If we returned lands to indigenous peoples, climate change would not be an issue, right? But to do that requires respecting indigenous sovereignty and indigenous understandings of borders. And that is something that is still not present today. So the environmental and climate crisis is all a result of imaginary dotted lines being marked over lands. And in the process of uh, gaining independence from colonialism and the global majority, you know, that required nation building that um, involves the demarcation of borders, right? That in itself, you know, Indonesia is itself a colonial country, still colonizes Papua, that is still a, a holdover from the colonial regime, right? National borders. Um, and borders are violence. If you think about the borders that you are within right now, um, your visa status, your, if you're a migrant like myself, you know, your passport status, this allows you to go in between nation states that have demarcated borders as a holdover from colonialism. And if you have a UK passport or an American passport or an Australian passport or, you know, an EU passport, you can go to places with other borders and you can take from those nations. You can extract resources. You can be tourists uh, with a resort and a private beach that once belonged to the public, right? So who gets to partake and enter which borders is obviously extremely political. And when you think about the fact that um, is by definition, you know, that is what politics is. And, and if you think about the fact that the U.S. military is the largest non-corporate polluter in the world, 
people tend to not think about that when they think about climate change, but really this whole genocidal machine needs to be brought down in order to stop climate change because it is creating enormous suffering around the world and has been, you know, you take places that have been deeply heavily extracted from and now have multinational corporations coming in, poisoning waters, um, pesticides, uh, mercury poisoning from mine tailings, all of this has been happening and happening and happening. Um, the end of the world has already happened, or in terms of, you know, its imminent presence, deleting, attempts to delete your cosmovision and your way of life and your language and your relationship to what is known as nature, right? Um, the Nigerian philosopher Bayo Akamolafe says that, you know, um, there was no such word as nature in in his culture, right? This is a, trees have rights, water has rights. In Bali, water definitely has rights. You know, there's like, they work on five calendars in Bali, the agricultural system, which is something um, I've learned from, you know, friends and, and colleagues. And this is, this cannot be solved by somebody going to, you know, get a master's in natural resources management and saying, this is how you organize nature, right? That is also an issue because the Western modernity uh, paradigm is always jonesing to make things fixed, to name things, to make things fixed, to put things in borders of categories and saying, this is universal. The universal does not exist, right? Every single biome and hundreds of thousands of different ways of relating to the natural world rely on so many different cosmologies and religions and understandings and philosophies and mathematics that um, Western colonial understandings cannot possibly comprehend and should not go in and say this is how you do things, especially since, you know, Bretton Woods institutions like the IMF and the World Bank have been asking countries from the global majority to cut private, um, to cut public services and become more corporate, become more capitalist. Um, this is all a result of saying, this is your country now, or this is our country now, and this is how we're going to delineate nature. This is where we're going to say, this is the part of nature that is great for tourism, where you can see paradise. And this is the part of nature that we're going to totally ravage. And those things are happening at the exact same time. So how do we map a resistance of bodily poetics, groundedness, and radical solidarities? what we can control and what we can't. Each of us is just one tiny human being on this planet. And it can be, I know, speaking personally, and I know for many others, extremely overwhelming to think about environmental crisis and climate crisis. But indigenous peoples have been resisting this for hundreds of years. Leanne Betasa, Leanne Betasa Mosake Simpson, excuse me, has an amazing book called As We Have Always Done. You know, this is radical indigenous resistances. And when you think about poetics, where does the poetry come in? Poetry is interwoven into every environmental crisis and the resistance against it. Because in the song stories that people tell about nature, with the names of plants and animals, in um, rituals and traditions, in just language and indigenous languages are disappearing at an alarming rate. These are all poetries, and environmental crises are, a crisis, are crises of the destruction of poetries, and the resistance against that also lies in poetries, and these may not always be public, you know, because of surveillance um, from the state, uh, resistance against environmental crises and climate crises is not, often doesn't have, you know, an Instagram or a Twitter but it lies in, in indigenous peoples getting together and as we've always done, resisting in some form. So there's collectivity, collectivity in poetics. Um, I find uh, Western poetry traditions to be, which you know I engage in, I participate in, and I love very much, um, but there's a sense of individualism that erases the collectivities of certain forms of poetry. And I'm going to use Pantun as an example. Pantun, P-A-N-T-U-N, is an Indonesian or Malay um, 
form of poetry and it's very communal. There's like pantun battles at weddings. There's, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of collectivity in pantun. And then I told a friend about pantun and who is also a poet and she was like, oh, pantoums, I thought they were French. We learned about them at school because I guess supposedly French people are sophisticated. Um, and it gets turned into this very individual thing. Um, but I think the hope it, in poetry is that it's never it can never be completely individualized because when you write poems about what you're feeling about the environment and climate crisis when you're naming things in nature or choosing not to translate them because that is a part of resistance as well is the right not to be translated um, because there are you know translators are a huge part of what has happened here translators enabled colonial expansion translators enabled oil fields to be you know um, uh, ravaged over, you know, rainforest lands that belong to indigenous peoples. All of this was facilitated by translators. And so the, the right of refusal, or um, as uh, Edouard Glisson says, the right to opacity, to not be understood because putting something out in the open that's so vulnerable, like the name of a very precious plant to your community also means, oh, somebody can pluck that, somebody can put that in a grocery store, right? There's always collectivity in poetry when you're writing something about the environment or climate crisis, you are expelling something, not expelling, sharing something from your body and putting it out into the world and asking people to, in collectivity, be with you and understand this feeling and then go towards what can we do. Um, and in terms of bodily poetics, I think groundedness is extremely important, no pun intended. It's a huge part of being with the earth is understanding the ground that we're on and the very many borders that enable us to live the lives we live and the cost of those borders for whether they be climate refugees, whether they be refugees from war. And when you think about it, the overarching scheme, one in the same, right? Um, whether you are a migrant like myself, what your visa status tells you, whether you have a UK passport, um, where you can go, what you can do, what commerce and the laws of commerce enable us to extract and turn into goods and commodities um, is all related to borders. And we're just following, we're in these lines, right? We, we have to live within these lines to survive. But resistance against those lines is ever present and is everywhere. And I see poetry as a huge part of that. And going back to groundedness, I think groundedness is fully understanding and meditating on how you as a person can engage in collectivity with others from where you are, because we can't do everything, <laughs> you know, um, we cannot, uh, we cannot save the world by ourselves, right? What you can do from where you are. Um, the literal earth that you are on right now and what enables you to be there. Why are you sitting or standing or lying down there legally or illegally, right? What enables you to be there and to think about the what has been paved over literally, right? The names of places and indigenous understandings of borders that are more fluid perhaps um, and or non-existent, you know, have been paved over, uh, named with new streets and new towns and new cities, and Manhattan becomes Manhattan. And when you think about how borders have created all these problems, it is easy to feel overwhelmed. But I think once again, groundedness in the self and breathing in the air you breathe and understanding that it's rare to be alive and it's special and we can only do what we can do today, but to understand also that there are real, um, there are people who, who are continuing to put their lives on the line for the survival of the entire world right now. And so to separate man and nature is nonsense. Um, and it, it fully erases the humanity of indigenous peoples. Um, I'm going to read a few poems from my book, Ultimatum Orangutan, or Ultimatum Orangutan, if you will. It is, um, a bilingual title. This one is called, and I'm going to speak about them a little bit, if you will indulge me. So this one is entitled Perimeter Blues. Squint wishing a mist to rise from the ether of beach resorts deadened. 
sand returning its infinite collar, bark lying still for a hundred years. Children led back to the bay where once it spat away ownership, when most knew the names for a shore's domed soul and dialect. My God, you're right, the sea, all land adjacent, God's spirit cordoned from me. Sit here while toes feel an ocean goddess, and she, Niroro Kidul, quietly ascertains that security will be coming for us shortly. So Niroro Kidul is a Javanese ocean goddess who, when I grew up, was portrayed as being very sort of <laughs> almost demonic. You know, she would seduce and kill sailors. And um, the older I get, I kind of, I sympathize, <laughs> I empathize with her and I see sort of a, a different, more feminist understanding of her. Um, but Perimeter Blues is about beach resorts deadened and children led back to the bay where once it spat away ownership where, you know, nowadays you can have security called on you if you go on a private beach that once belonged to everyone. Um, I'm just also going to read out Remaining Outpost from the same book, Timatumorangutan. And it's for my dad, and it's about language, and this refusal to translate, right? Because of what borders allow people to do to things that are named so that they can for, therefore be catalogued and extracted from. Remaining outpost. Snow presents itself on green leaves. Rain seeps into dry season. More time left for protection of species and language. My father cracks us open a rainforest plant he's forgotten the name of, brought home to city. Inside, two translucent alien orbs, large with seed, Sweet and off-white as kalenkeng, longer and more oval, orange, sappy, with tang, another fruit. Liwat, yet untranslated into English, unextracted from on mass to shelf groceries. Sliver of its bright saliva spun out. The hooting relief of these mysteries entering our consciousness, while plain as the sun, for people freed from our kind of terrible, jealous and guzzling, miserly, prickly with sodium lorth sulfate and parabens, a wash and a drowning, online sales for clothing, a spike of adrenaline, the woods as a set of conquerable names. Um, I think humility is a, <laughs> is a constant struggle for everyone, but I think it's safe to say that if you're watching this, you probably don't think that humans have dominion over everything on earth, right? Um, but should, you know, as in the best cases, live in harmony and, and as stewards of the environment. Um, I'm going to read the titular poem now, Ultimatum Orangutan, because it's a bit of a long one, and I think um, the organizers are probably going to be able to put a text of it that I'm going to send on screen as well. So, I wrote this because I've been, I was thinking so much about um, this word orangutan, or persons or peoples of the forest, and I think about what led to this horrific environmental destruction in Indonesia um, that is now continuing in the form of, you know, bogus carbon credit schemes, which if you don't know, are really and provably um, schemes for companies to say, oh, I can pollute here because I bought this rainforest part over here, <laughs> right? It doesn't solve the issue. Return land to indigenous peoples. That's, it is so simple, the solution to climate change. It's been proven that if you return land to indigenous peoples as stewards, um, we can really take care of the environment. But again, borders, right? And again, dictates from World Economic Forum or what have you about how to manage your natural resources and how to enable the grinding wheels of capital to continue in the form of commodifying carbon credits and biodiversity credits and basically, you know, saying, oh, it's okay if you pollute here. And, and it's, it is land theft. It is land theft. And um, land theft continues to be at the root of all environmental crises. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about orangutans and that word. So this is the poem. Ultimatum orangutan. The original King Kong story was set on an island of Sumatra, 
perhaps Nias. So this is twisted phobia of what is now Indonesian man and fear of his usurping of his big hairy hands on a blonde ingenue on the needle of white capitalism, the Empire State Building. I understand visual chimp language. I know what KK was trying to say in every edition of that film. Naomi Watts may not have understood, but for years I was obsessed with a painting of a young brown child next to a monkey by abuser Gogan, and have stared many hours at that monkey as stand-in for some kind of brown masculinity, cow, domestic, speaking across the years, transcending forms of visual media, asking King Kong softly, what is this world we were drawn into? So this next part, um, there was a fake coup in 1965 to 66 uh, that was created and armed by Western forces, including the UK and the US, that caused a genocide in Indonesia of up to two and a half million people, including the genocide of many feminists, um, the slander of many feminists. Indonesia had the world's largest feminist movement in the 60s until feminists were literally killed. Um, and again, this is a genocide supported by Western forces as part of anti-communist Cold War tactics. But the people who died, you know, were people... They, they made a hit list, and that hit list became inflamed and turned into a gigantic cesspool of murder. Um, and these murders were created in order to enable borders of land to be thieved for capitalism. <laughs> that is why people were killed. That is specifically why people were killed. Um, and this continues to this day. Uh, but I don't think in the West uh, enough people know about the genocide. And usually when it is portrayed, um, my colleague Intan Paramadita has an amazing academic article. She's a film studies scholar about how there's usually like this trope of discovery of like, we discovered the Indonesian genocide, and, you know, usually by white men <laughs> um, that portray it in a very sort of uh, strangely, you know, um, orientalist and... Uh, violence porn kind of gaze but this is my perspective coming up continuing this poem as somebody who grew up in the dictatorship that was you know began at the start of that genocide i'll tell you small animal a world where for decades small children under a red and white sigil were lullabied women's rights and labor organizers were sadists did unspeakable things dancing sexily in their communist gear killed the generals like animals instead of being told generals organized a genocide of people suspected of communism likely millions of people ended who were simply feared of usurping remember the film rounded up for no master other than bloodthirst a gentle artist among them who drew their last in 1965-66. Rewind, perhaps not no master. Ultimately, nobody's real uncle by the name of Sam sanctioned slash planned all of this to open up lands, with giant forklift hands letting millions of bodies fall to the ground as it was all lifted into another country entirely. People's homes and cosmologies in rainforest lifted and dropped into the laps of people who cannot pronounce us, and only the most powerful of those who can, who claim to be of us. And so many wrestled this machinery with lives paid for for so very long. Marcina had 24, are many of stealth, but the sigil fist, but the red and white, the red and white and blue, it caved us and caved us and caved us. Many forced to drink from it, and many said, Tida, no. And every year, get the Gapulu S, 30th September, they'd show the violent film recreating supposed mutiny, images of blood that snapped our childhoods in two. When I speak to people about palm oil plantations, this devastation of Papuans, Dayak, Padang, et al., invariably the words palm oil make them think of orangutans, we need to save them. I found myself thinking orangutans and so many peoples as well, but this phrase does not fit well on campaigns against palm oil. And whenever I see a billboard with an orangutan on it campaigning against palm oil, I say yes. I say is this what it takes, and always I say, and so many peoples as well. Is it any coincidence that King Kong shown up so much with animals extinct rising again, Brontosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus, other twisted notions of the other crafted into scales and claw? 
and I think about a child so small, so sad, fearful to breathe from all the blood in the air, adult nightmares seeping into her sky and her books and her friends. And just now I remember being her and being her. And I'm thinking about Donkey Kong as a Super Smash Bros. character and what color the thread is between the child and the pixelated animal who pounds the earth and a piece of electronics made with metals forged from this earth. And all through the making of these things, the monkey on screen, the small sad girl, and the screen she refused to open her eyes for futilely as the story would seep into the school days of her and her friends. There are our words communicating to all the sentient fellow beings who were placed on this earth gingerly and asked to go forth in it as though this were not a frightening thing as though this very act of going forth did not require a shipful of warm glow around us in order to survive and how we wish for this freight cargo every day creating it preserving it with oral literatures they can't touch or feel with herbal medicines we try to protect from pharmaceutical gloves with every day a ticking towards the end of glowing the end of holding another who could be person who could be old growth rainforest who could be king kong and his tears who could be papuan men writing white letters on themselves in jail to display for the trial at which they are accused of treason against indonesia that say monyet which means monkey which is what evil in some calls good in others when it wants to let us know this earth is taken in their movie of the present when the earth is yours, it is yours, 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 dear protesters, Maraukai to Sabang, tears when in courtrooms, when witnessed by none, is yours, glory humans, yours, my dear sayang, semuanya, all dear lord, ya Tuhan tanganmu, your hands tanganmu, your earth milikmu are yours. Setiap hari, each day, nafas, breath adalah doa, is a prayer, yang mengungkapkan, which conveys, ultimatum kami semua persetan, ultimatum, ultimatum from all of us, damn it all, dari semua manusia yang muak dan bergelora dalam amarah, yang masih bisa tertawa antara sesama setiap saat, from all humans who are sick of it and are reveling in rage, who can still at any time laugh among ourselves. Dan juga ultimatum dari semua yang mereka bakar. And also ultimatum, ultimata from all they burned. Burned will burn. Juga dari orang hutan. Also from orangutans. Thank you. Um, so if I will leave you with anything, it is with once again thank you to Bo Arts and Leah and everyone who is watching this. And to say that there is hope in poetics, there is hope in poetry. Um all the many, 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 many countless poems that have been written over hundreds of years and songs and storytelling that resist borders, that resist the way we are told we are separate from nature, that resist the way we are told that our ways of life do not matter, um, that we are destined for extinction. There has been resistance for all these hundreds of years and that lies in poetics and poetry is something that borders um, cannot completely take hold over. So thank you.